So permaculture for beginners, um, I want you to take a moment before we begin to think about, do you have a permaculture dream? Do you have something that, that you really, really value that you see in your mind that, that if you were able to make happen, it would improve and grow. You'd get an abundance. You would partner with the natural cycles. Do you have a permaculture dream? Because I certainly did. And that's a big part of, that's a big part of my journey is that, um, I, I, I had that, I had that, that vision, I had that dream. And, and once I was able to really start moving towards that dream, it became more and more real. So wherever you are, and <clears throat> that's why I'm not putting anything up right now, because I want you to think about this because permaculture is a crazy, amazing menu of options in many ways. And so I want your dreams, your, your hopes, all the ideas that you have to be the things that lead in this space. So, so I want you to think about all the things that you want to do. This is a great time to get out a notebook, a pen, a piece of paper, because you're going to have ideas come to you. You're going to have inspiration come to you. Your, your vision is going to unfold because that's what happens to everyone. You know, when you start digging into permaculture or returning to permaculture for some folks, because you start to rekindle your why, why am I doing this? You're doing this because you had a dream of abundance. You're doing this because you saw that nature could be partnered with. You knew you saw that other people were successful at this. And so you applied it and you saw success too. And it's that pattern of adoption and sharing and change that, that is so natural and it makes everyone better. And that's that adaptive exponential community growth that, you know, it's, it's wild that, that we lost that in so many ways in our local communities, but with the loss of community, we lost those beautiful elements of community. Right. And so permaculture is one of those ways to bring that back. So you could be thinking about that too, whatever your dream is, I'm still going on your dream. <laughs> But whatever your dream is, it could be abundance, it could be, you know, all these different things. So before I even begin with what I'm going to say about what permaculture is, my story, all of that, I want you to start with your dream. Because permaculture is about you actuating on these kinds of things and doing it in a way that makes the world a better place and makes your life better. So so we'll get into all of it in a, in, a, in a second here, but I just want you to know that this is about your vision. So take the time to write it down, to think about it and to make it happen. Okay. Give you some tools to make it happen too. All right. So I'm Matt Powers. I was a ski racer growing up. So topographic maps made a lot of sense to me because I was always looking at topographic maps. And then I had a, a knee thing and a surgery when I was like 16 and I no longer was a racer. So I became, I put all that attention and focus on music and, and I was able to, in a very short period of time, apply those same skills, um, that I was, there we go those same skills from racing, I was able to apply to, to, to music. And so I was able to, within two years, be playing with people like this um, on bass. I was the bass player. They're obviously not the bass player. <laughs> but yeah, so like amazing people. I was, that's Saturday Night Live's drummer uh, and with the hat, ZZ Top's guitarist, obviously B Billy Gibbons. Um, and in that time period, I met my wife. I, uh, we were, we were very young. We got married. We, I just knew she was my wife, actually. Uh, I, I knew she was my wife. And, and so we, we got married when we were young. And within a year of, of that marriage, we, we had our first son. And then within a year of that, she got cancer. 
so we were still very, very young when she got cancer and she lost her thyroid. And that's been like a huge theme in our lives that because she lost her thyroid when she was young before we had our second child. And at that point, they didn't know if you could have a child without a thyroid, right? And so, and it wasn't easy. It was terribly hard to call him our angel baby, our second child. So it was a very difficult time. It was like a terrible, terrible time. Um, and I lost trust in, in the, you know, the whole medical system. Um, I, I really, I really struggled in this time period when my wife had cancer because, um, I didn't know what to do. I was like, you know, a musician. I played bass, <laughs> four strings, right? Not so complicated, you know, rock music. And so like, this was really overwhelming. And I, I was, and I was, we had a baby and she is losing, you know, the engine of her metabolism and they're having her take radioactive substances that she's not wearing a suit. They're wearing a suit while they bring in the case that's containing the case that has the pill in it. And she's got to open it like what? Like what? Really? Oh, oh. so I had to heal from that. And one of those ways was taking action and, and learning how, how we could, we, we could prevent cancer from coming back because it kept coming back. And one, one of the things that she wanted to do, I asked her when she was healing, because what happened was she took that radiation, they ablated her thyroid. And then she, three months later, got huge amounts of skin cancer that almost reached her lymph nodes and they had to do surgery and it was awful. And so I was like, okay, honey, you've had cancer three times in six months. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? She goes, I want to go home to my mom. I've been married two years, you know, two and a half years at this point. I have a baby. She goes, okay. So that meant quitting the cringe, which is Rachel Ray's husband's band. And the guy who I found to replace me, because I had to find the replacement for me, is still in the band. And I left in 2007. So I could have stayed that whole time. They thought they all thought I was crazy for leaving. They're like, you know, you just stay, right? Um, so so yeah. Yeah, it was really, it was really a hard time. Um, and I I I I I became a substitute teacher. Limos used to pick me up. And I used to go on like TV and like on the Rachel Ray everyday Rich, we would like play music and I'd be playing the bass. Young Matt, oh, got everything going on, making, you know, money with buying bass and having a two-story apartment in Brooklyn. Like I, I, I had compared to my like peers who were like all like bartending and waiting. They're like, Matt has made it. You know what I mean? And so to go from that to subbing in Fresno, was it was a hard thing but 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 it was necessary really really necessary for my development um i i became mr powers and <laughs> and i was able to 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 help kids you know and and i didn't realize how valuable my education was until until um, I saw people who didn't have an education in Fresno. And so I was I was so torn up by how little education they had. And then and and later it became, well, what are they going to do? Like they're not getting educated. So what are they going to do? And so and this is part of the impetus of who, who I, who I am, or how I became this, I was sitting subbing and it was awful. It's awful. And it's like 11 o'clock. The, the, the thing goes off and the kids all like start bringing around these books and they're like children's books and they're handing them out. And then they're like going, talking to each other and like flipping the books, like, like weird, really, really weird. And it, I, even today, it like, it hurts me so bad. I'm like, what are you guys doing? You're freaking me out. Cut it out. I'm like, you're not, this is, you, first of all, you're not reading. Second of all, these are children's books. And it's like, they're like, this is remedial reading. This is what they make us read. And I was like, 
and so they have you pretend to read and you, it's like a truce between you but it's really them seeing making sure that you don't get educated and it was so deeply painful i was like what is this like what is this you're shaming the kids instead of helping them learn to read it's like you find the thing they care about reading and you teach them with that it's so mind-blowingly easy to teach people you know you find what they love <laughs> and help them that's all you do and i got a master's degree in education to learn how to do that really well you know what i mean and understand like methods and all these things but but that's what we that's what we're doing um All right. So we raised our kids doing permaculture, working with animals. James started riding at a very, very young age. He started working with wild mustangs. You know, uh, it's uh, our boys we raised out, out in California. We lived on that property with her parents for nine years. We didn't leave. I took over the garage. Um, which had paint peeling on it, which is, you know, chemicals and all that. There's a whole conversation there. But but we got out of the garage eventually, you know, uh, and but but our kids, we raised our kids there, and it was really wonderful to have their cousins and their aunts and uncles and their grandparents and their great grandparents next door up the hill. And so it was really a potent, powerful experience for our kids to be raised within four generations and have so much family and to see so many uh, different ideas and voices and people so that they were, you know, they, they were their own person. You know what I mean? It's a, it, it was pretty powerful. Um, so, so yeah, it was, we, and then we, we gardened and then was because of the situation you, you'll soon find out. Um, I had to turn to permaculture and it was how I raised my kids actually. Um, you know, my, this boy right here is almost, you know, he's turning 18 this year. And so it's like, it's really, it's really, uh, been a, a journey, um, that started with this effort to, to really help um, my wife and my kids have better food and then turned into so much more. Just trying to click that person loud on me. And so our boys, they started off very young in the gardens. I've been doing this a long time. And I started applying it to curriculum because I realized that there's jobs connected to this that could start from scratch. And yeah, like seeds, like you could start very, very like low budget. And so I did that because I had no budget. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was trying to do organic food for my wife, but it was so expensive because I was, you know, just a teacher. Uh, and and it was it was that 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 mission. There we go. It was that mission to be able to do something to model it to the kids, but also to help myself out of the situation I was in. That beautiful virtuous cycle, you know, where we're grow we're all growing together. It, you know what I mean? That's that's goes back to the original idea, right? That's the truth. There there is this sweet spot where we really can help each other um, by you helping yourself first, and then having an abundance and then being able to apply that in different ways. Uh, I fell in love with, with seed saving and I eventually became a spokesperson for a popular seed company an heirloom seed company that many of you probably know of. Um, and I did a couple things that were considered impossible. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I, I, this is impossible Peruvian purple speckled corn. Uh, it's Piscaranto, um, Highland Valley Peruvian corn, and it's a land race. But those speckles um, have come up multiple times from seed savers. The thing is, 
there was like a universal like Esperanto like language that the Indians used um, uh, and from all the way South America, all the way up, uh, like seeds were exchanged through different people. And in North America, they had this like sign language that they would actually allow, they would communicate for trade. But seed savers um, were allowed to just go between places and they were the ones that were like allowed to freely travel, right? And so they did. And so you see these speckles in different areas of Native American corn all over America, but not like this. <laughs> the profusion is quite impressive. Uh, and that's why I had to grow it. I didn't realize that I was doing something impossible, but I applied permaculture logic and it was easy. What do I mean? Okay, this corn is photoperiodic. What does that mean? Well, it means that you have you have corn that only requires a certain amount of light and then too much is too much and then it does vegetative growth like crazy. And if it's also, it handles its water weird because it's used to 9,000 feet and you bring it down to like, 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 you know, like Florida or like some shoreline place or the Midwest, it's going to freak out. So I was at 2,000 feet and I put it on the shady side of the hill. So it only got four hours of afternoon sunlight. Guess what? Even though it got diffuse sunlight the whole day long, it was, was essentially like energy jewels. Like we gave it so little energy that it mimicked what it was going to get. It was at 2000 feet. So it was like close and it's mountainous. So uh, we were in the foothills, uh, like outside of Yosemite. Uh, and so, um, And so this corn, I, I just was like, oh, well, let's put it on the side of the hill. It's shady. You know what I mean? We'll mimic micro the microclimate. It worked like a charm and no one had ever done it. And so that's part of the reason why I became that spokesperson. Uh, and so I became, this is me actually, this is from one of my books. I became like obsessed with permaculture and I started focusing on teaching it. Uh, cause I was already a master's, had a master's degree and I was teaching teachers how to specifically do best practices and specifically get rid of homework because if you're doing authentic learning, there's no need for homework. Right. Right. So, uh, you don't need to have your job spill over into their personal time or their family time. If you're good at your job, you do it during the time allotted for you. Some teachers didn't like that. Uh, and so, <laughs> but authentic learning is authentic learning. Um, and so the results speak for themselves. Uh, you have to find the pathway that they are excited about and then apply the standards in a, in a way that's authentic. And then it will be encoded at such a deep level um, and be connected to value to, for them that you accelerate learning in a way that's kind of um, incomparable. Uh, so there's no need to like, you focus on like test prep tactically and like, right. St strategy wise, not even content wise, because the content is like baked into who they are and identity and what they love. So easy. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, when I was a public school teacher, I had 155 different preps because all my kids I had a differentiated curriculum for them because they created menus. And so I love permaculture because that's what it says. <laughs> So I also love permaculture because it allows you to do things that people think are impossible. Um, and so I threw all those seeds on the ground um, and they're trained to do that. So the first season you throw seeds on the ground, you know, a whole bunch of them don't do well, but the few that do save seed from those. And then the next season, all the seeds come up, maybe 98%. The next season after that, they all come up and they're like, bam, and it's wild. It's like, so two to three seasons in training seeds, a huge difference, huge difference. So throw, so seed saving and throw, so seeds was like a huge thing that I was really focused on, um, back in the day. Uh, and, and I, I'm really excited now that we're, we're, we're setting up this large food forest. Um, and hopefully we're not going to have another 200 year drought event this year. Uh, uh, but 
I'm setting up, you know, to, to bring back all my land races and then bring back all of the Peruvian corn. I mean, I keep my corn in the fridge and always have. So the viability is just fine. That's the thing is it's like, if you take care of your seed properly, you dry it down properly. You understand certain precepts like, and rules and like all these different things around seed saving. And there's excellent books for that. that you can just get like, uh, the seed savers guide or so the seed, seed savers exchange, um, they have an incredible, um, incredible, the seed garden, uh, book, but it's just a guide. So you're going to still have to put some years into that because, um, you'll see, you'll see, um, you can, you, you can do the things, but you'll get better at it within two to three years. All right. So this happened. So, um, Sorry, I have to do the mouse thing. Um, so I was thinking about my kids and I was teaching them Kickstarters. Uh, this is like a thing that we were focused on, you know, entrepreneurism at the school and and there's tech and music and they let me bring in gardening and seed saving. So it's like a specialized charter school that I was at, right? And so I was like, I'm... I'm taking Jeff Lawton's PDC and I was like, Jeff, can I turn your PDC into a curriculum for K through 12? And he was like, yeah. And so I'm trained seventh through 12th grade. Uh, that's what I'm calibrated to. And I tend to write at 10th grade cause that's what I became an English teacher in. So I tend to write at like a challenging common, like reading level. <laughs> So, and I and, and what I do is I I go to a, like condense things down to that reading level so that's easy to, to understand harder concepts. Um, that's what I still do today with the things I do. Um, so so let me let this person in. So this book, what happened was in three days, this book uh, made its goal. And this was such a big deal because no one had created curriculum yet for the kids. And so they didn't have anything that was digestible. Um, and so I was able to bring this, I was able to line things to standards and then improve things for even further with the, the next books. But but this was the beginning and I was still a teacher. People thought I was going to quit immediately. I stayed for the full year, of course, and then debated about coming back. And it was very difficult. Um, I, I leaving my kids was very difficult, but it was 443 backers. It was absolutely a, just a smash hit. Uh, and I, I was able to, to pay for incredible illustrations. Uh, and the books went around the world. They got translated into different languages. Uh, there's, there's, there's a more, more translations than that. Now I work with people like this from all over the world. Uh, and, and then I became a speaker, started traveling, started work, helping different groups. So I became, uh, like an advisor and I expanded the food forest at the world beat center and eventually became a citizen scientist. And I worked with people like this on the regenerative soil work. And my, in that time period, my family grew up. So they're, and this is, this is a while ago. They don't look like this now. My, my babies are bigger than this. So, <laughs> so the, it's, it's it, time has elapsed and I've been able to raise my kids with permaculture constantly everywhere we've moved. I've installed a new food forest everywhere we've been. I've had a garden and, and compost. And so it's, it's been this journey that they, they all participated in, they know well, it's just been part of their lives. And in that time period, I've become the author, the educator, the entrepreneur, the soil expert, the citizen scientist and seed farmer and family guy that I am today. So I've had some new additions. Uh, I've, I've had some translations and it's been over two dozen publications in nine years. So it's been quite the journey. <laughs> I was creating all that curriculum 
for all those kids individually. And so the idea of creating just curriculum in a way that was open for people to dig into was what I, where I, I came in. I was like, oh, okay, I can facilitate more people to get into this and see how they, you know, because of what I did, what I did in the classroom was figure out what they love and connect it to the standards. And that's what I do with my homeschooling and unschooling with my boys. And so, um, and, and so it's, 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 it's very easy. You just you show people things and offer a menu and, and, and get people to have their dreams. Like we talked about at the beginning, because those dreams will lead us into that regenerative future. And so I've been focused on the bridge to that, to all the dreams so that folks can, can, can make it a reality so that folks can make it a business so that folks can make the world a better place and at the same time have a business of integrity have the same time change the economy fundamentally to be one that changes the world around them and from the grassroots up from choice from integrity from community from local from bioregional and and uh and, and, and have it be that free honor and free um amazing expression of, of, of community um so i i, I really i'm really excited about that so what is permaculture you're like matt what you tell me all about this but what about that all right well let's get into it <laughs> so it started off as permanent agriculture actually which makes a lot of sense now doesn't it permaculture permanent agriculture um but eventually it became permanent cultures and um, that's because of uh, Bill Mollison, uh, and that's because of uh, David Holmgren. And these men, uh, there's a whole story here. I'm not going to go into the whole story here. But basically, he was a professor searching for the theory for everything. And he was in a flat that David was living in. And David was a 17-year-old genius working on his thesis and his thesis um, was permaculture one. So, so let me just let these folks in. And so permaculture one was the book that they wrote together. There we go. And so David was just a, a, a kid. Bill, David's still with us. Um, and Bill, you know, he's older, uh, and Bill passed away already, but together they, they honed this idea that David started with that Bill noticed was like, this coincides with my theory for everything. And so it, it's an incredible thing what they did. Um, and what happened was they did that in 1978 and then in 88, the permaculture designers manual um, which, which uh, mine's like falling apart. I've read it so many times. I love that book 88. And then pepper and permaculture was 1995. And that was David's 10 years of practicing permaculture where instead of doing a designer's manual, like Bill did really quick in 88, they, he, he worked it. He did it. He lived it. And then that that information became the book, and 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 then he went further and wrote the principles of design in permaculture, which is a beautiful book. Um, it's like principles and patterns. I, I know I mixed that up, um, but David wrote that, and that was uh, two thousand two or two thousand four. Um, but they all these books have only recently you know in time come out and what they are is looking back at the longest lasting cultures on earth from all different walks of life but primarily the australian aboriginal culture which makes a lot of sense because that's where they are that's where 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 bill is an expert you know bill is like a is a tasmanian aboriginal expert uh, and so, so it's, it's all overlaps with what they're, what they're really, really good at and what their focus was. 
So, so that's a huge part of it too, is that time period in the seventies, uh, and the eighties in Australia, you couldn't call, you know, permaculture, Aboriginal culture and have it get much traction. You know, there's, there's social things for reasons around that. Um, and so permaculture, it looked at all the cultures and realized that there were aspects to every culture, Japan, they looked at extensively China, they looked at extensively. Um, but then we see it in, in, in the, the Indians and Native American culture in South America. We see it um, in different areas of, of, of the Mediterranean. We see it in cultures all over the world throughout all time. And it's aspects where we're acting regenerative. And so you're like, oh, that culture, they like did this terrible thing. It's like, yeah, but look how they handle their toilets. It's like, we can do that, can't we? It's like, we don't need to do all that other crazy stuff. That's okay. You know what I mean? They, they don't do it now. Don't hold it against the people who live there a thousand years later. But, but let's take that crazy, amazing regenerative soil, uh, um, regenerative uh, toilet system they, they, they did, right? You know? So there are, there's, there's a lot of um, value in, 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 in just t taking a lens to history where you, 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 you look at it for what it is. And that's what they did. And they distilled all these wonderful things. Um, I take a lot from Mayan and Incan culture that I love. Um, and I don't take all of it. You know what I mean? And that's okay. Um, my Celtic heritage has head hunting in it and head collecting in it i don't want that you know um but that's part of all of our history all of us have something like that back there you know but that's okay and so permaculture really went through and just looked at all the cultural examples um i mean look at colonial america philadelphia let's go to philadelphia colonial america and then we're looking that's not the accent man uh, and then we look at there and then they have wooden pipes that they seal with plant resin and they, they still last to today. Wait, wait, what? Yeah. So like, let's honor everyone for everything, everywhere, because from that looking for the good, we'll push forward into that regenerative future. Um, the deconstructionism, the, the, finding all the different things that's just going to eat up our time. We don't have time for that. Uh, and so it was so beautiful about permaculture. It's solution based. It's ethics based because we're looking forward. We're looking at things with lenses to di discern. And those lenses are earth care, people care and future care. So earth care, we obviously, we have, the, so I, I put the Venn diagrams behind inside the Venn diagrams and that's me. <laughs> Earth care, people care and future care. Um, those are the three ethics of permaculture. Future care has changed several times throughout history. It's had like, I think six permutations. Um, and, and so there are people have their favorite version of that and they like cling to it. Um, I really like future care because it encompasses everything without any bias or suggestion or connotation. Fair share indicates someone needs to dictate what is fair and we don't want dictators. So, so we have to realize that it has to be different. Um, and there's a lot there that like future care is powerful. People care has all the things that people wanted return of surplus and all those kinds of things to be in there and future care does too, but you separate them properly which by having people care be interpersonal, interpersonal and, and to be able to understand if these things are truly honoring each other, it's better to separate them. Future care also wasn't suggested by me. <laughs> future care I, was suggested over 20 years ago uh, and adopted by certain people in, in the permaculture community. So these things all have a long history around them though people have very strong opinions because um, they read different books at different times uh, in their lives. And that's okay. We're all learning and growing. Um, and that's what's so cool about permaculture is that um, it's a conversation because we're learning from nature. 
And that's really what it is, learning through nature's patterns, cycles, and systems to benefit people, nature, and our collective future. Uh, that's what permaculture is. Uh, and, and so when we talk about, you know, the degradation of soil, the loss of topsoil, um, the loss of minerals, uh, desertification, um, eutrophication, um, the death of like 90% of the kelp off of the coastline, you know what I mean? All these things are things that we need to be aware of that we can actually counteract and you're like oh it was ocean warming that caused all the kelp die off yeah and guess what we can use marine permaculture to bring an upwelling back back into flow because that's a lack of upwelling you bring the upwelling back up uh, into flow with this and it's very easy to do use wave power to pump it up this is very cheap and easy to do and you bring that cold water back up and keep the kelp alive we literally can can fix that and bring back the because 60 to 90 percent of your air your 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 oxygen in your air is coming from the oceans depending on what time of year it is in the winter it can be like all like all of your oxygen is coming from the ocean why because plants aren't photosynthesizing and molecules can take up to three years to go from the southern to the northern hemisphere because they're going different directions so they cleave so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's like really important to recognize that. Um, but like, that's the thing is it's like recognizing how things work um, and honoring those systems because they're so powerful and, and, and transformative. Um, interesting. So it really covers everything. Um, I know that... Um, um, I know that um, this seems like really, really intensive, but whether you're designing a business, whether you're designing a life, whether you're designing a system or a of anything, this, this, is, this is really critically important. You know what I mean? Is it taking care of people? Is it taking care of, hold on, let me um, take the scribbler away from Sarah. There you go. All right. So um, thank you all for being here. So let me actually do this. Yeah. All right. There we go. So it really covers everything and it's about alignment to natural cycles, recognition of natural principles and those ethics. Because if we can design systems to to restore and regenerate natural resources and honor them at the same time, and recapture them and recycle them, you know, because I mean, it's so, it's so ridiculous. We, we have the ability to just reuse glass. We don't need to crush it down and use it again. I'm sorry. I remember the nineties. We were, I went and visited my, my brother when he was living in France and they just reused the bottles. All the bottles were chipped and dinged. It was awesome. They used it for the water, the wine, the new sodas. Everything had bottles that were being reused. So, so th this is this is not like you know foreign. This is not like weird or, or 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 backwards. This is all potently powerful stuff. So, and it's stuff that our ancestors did, in different variations all over the world, and you know what I mean at different times. Because we, we're we good at it and they're not so good at it all the time, all everywhere, you know. And so, so you, have, you have different examples of different cultures and different time periods of different cultures. Japan, Edo, E-D-O, Edo period Japan is the time period to study Japan to understand their best expressions of permaculture. 
And we do that, you know, in, in some of my courses. So looking at those examples, boiling them down to the universal principles at work, the reason why that thing they're doing is working. Mollison had these five explicit uh, principles work with nature. This is the whole point, right? Two, the problem is the solution. Three, make the least change for maximum benefit. Oh. Um, the yield of a system is theoretically infinite because it's up to our minds. I mean, you could be running a farm and then you're like, well, what if I started doing tours? That's another yield. What if you started doing... You know what I mean? Like it just, it's your creativity limit is the limit. Right. And then you do like a live feed and then you have like a course and then you take that footage and then right. Right. So it just stack, stack, stack. And then everything gardens, everything in, in, in life, in nature gardens. And we have to recognize how and why you're like, what the, whoa, 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 what about the pathogens and the blights? How are they gardening? They're taking a plant that doesn't have the ability to protect itself so it's not healthy, and they are composting it in place to make way for a new plant. That's what they're doing. It's gardening. All right. And these are these are the principles and pathways beyond sustainability. That's the title. Sorry, David. Um, his book in 2002. There we go. Uh these are his bill had like a ton more than his five. He had birches and well, I'll show you some of that and stuff in a second, but it, it they all have different principles and he, and David boiled them down to these 12 because people love 10, 12, something like that. He's also one who didn't introduce fair share and that, you know, um, for a lot of people who decides what's fair. Um, uh, you know what I mean? Who dictates what return of surplus means, who dictates, you know, control and population, you know, the original seventies thing. And so it's like, none of that, none of that's viable, you know? Um, and, and so that language, that's why it's future care, right? Um, because, uh, that freedom, uh, stands, uh, stands ahead of all those things. And fair share is actually under care for people. Uh, and it's um, fair as what you see as fair from your abundance, because it has to be given from a free heart in order for it to be really valued and powerful and, and changing. So, so yeah, not coercion, choice, empowerment, all those beautiful things. But he intended that too. And it's just the words, right, right, right. Um, but, um, but it's also really important because words are very important. So I have uh, well over 20 in my book and I also include social principles and they're not, they're not like scary. It's like, <laughs> it's like smile, like family first. It's like, you know what I mean? It's like things like that. Um, and it's all free to download the permaculture student Two is on my website. It's a free ebook. Um, and so I've got tons of principles. I, I, I cover all the ones I basically gather, combine, and then add. Because there needed to be a principle of choice because people have to have choice. If you're going to say you're going to take away people's choice, you're in for a fight, you know? And so principle of empowerment, because we need to be able to give people choice and empowerment because people know better when they, ha when they know better. Like this goes back to like when I was an educator, when kids succeed when they can, you need to give kids the, the, the actual understanding and the tools to like succeed. Um, they're not failing on purpose, you know what I mean? So, so I, I, I delved into all that and, um, I, so much, so much of this stuff comes from my experience with teaching thousands and thousands of students and I've applied it all to permaculture to refine it. And so, yeah, anyway, I'll talk more about it in a minute, but, um, the pattern and cycles of nature. So this is the edge effect. Um, we have to recognize that there are universal patterns in nature that um, we we are always going to run up against or, or 
we will align with and just experience a huge lift. And like, that's the power I see of, of permaculture is, is we have really have the ability to like help people. And, and it comes from recognizing the power of nature. And so when we think about edge effect, think about the ocean. It's the meeting of where the, the, all the water environment meets with the land environment. That's an edge. And in that place, it's not A plus B equals A, the number of animals and interactions um, together, addition-wise. There's an X factor. So it's like the sum of the two parts is way more. There's Y because there's land animals, there's ocean animals, and then there's edge species animals. And so there's actually like a huge amount. And then because it's a fertile area, it attracts the animals that travel through biomes. So that's a four, right? And so you have this huge population mixing and interacting event at these edge spaces. You're like, yeah, but how is this like a principle? Put up a fence, a hard fence against the wind and watch what happens. It'll catch litter, it'll start building soil, it'll create habitat, it'll create microclimate. It will, uh, you will see, you know, birds using it for perch and their manure is dropping down. They're adding seeds there from far, far away. This is edge effect. Edges are incre incredibly potent. And in fact, if you think of the cell, let's go deep. If you think of the cell, the nucleus is not the brain of the cell. The nucleus is the reproductive organ. So it's the DNA. It's, it's, it's not the brain. The membrane is the brain. It's the discernment. It allows things in and out. And it actually, it, what, what comes in triggers the genetic expression of that cell. So it's the discernment. It's, the, it's an experiencing the environment and responding. It's the brain. And so it's the edge between spaces. So this edge effect is so potent, so powerful. Creating differentiation is what we're doing with soil structure. If you till it all, make it one pH, one EH, and it's this one conglomerate, like it's all pH eight, exactly. It's nitrogen is exact. It will literally not be happy because it's the differentiation, it's the swings in pH and EH in the soil micrometer to micrometer that allows for exchange to happen. So we have to have changes in charge, changes in nutrients and moisture and oxygen and air and all of it, because that's how things cycle. And so, so these principles are universal. These principles are universal. We see this, you, you know, I mean, the, the productivity we, we, we see, we see we in, in, in these systems through the roof when we add an edge. Think about this. When you have a field, a one acre field, and you line it with trees, creating an edge as a windbreak, there's reports that it's uh, in France uh, of doing this, it's 14 to 15% more productive. That, that is huge. And we're talking about field like annuals, you know, that they're doing like wheat and stuff. That's huge though, like huge. And it's because of the windbreak. It's because of the habitat. It's because of the exodus feeding the microbes because they're perennials throughout the hardier times of year where the fields fallow and they're harboring microbes are harboring on the edges of the field. And then when the, 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 the wheat's growing in or the annuals come back, they run back into the field and then they, they get, they, 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 they travel. All right. So the soil food web, the soil food web um, is, is a critical part of this. And it's like the economy of the soil. And things are giving, things are taking, things are donating, things are senescing, things are 
like there's all this secession there's all this there's there's competition there's co cooperation it's it's incredible but there's always exchange there's always exchange there's always a give and take there's a, as as bill mollison says in the permaculture designers manual in 1988 the user must pay and so that's why we have to do the work we got to do our part. We're part of nature. So we got to contribute. We got to align. We got to do the work and, and we will see amazing things happen. And so, well, some of these things are pretty simple too. You know, like we, we, we talk about the behavior of, of, of heat, of air, of water, of, of slope so that we design properly sun angle. Yeah, it's a big one. Uh, right, right, right. And so like all these things, the way we design, the way we think, the way we shelter, the way we create microclimates, all of these, that's a microclimate right there. Huh? Um, and you know, it's a microclimate because the stones are going to be thermal mass. They're going to, they're going to store heat for that fruit tree right there. And that water, that water's doubling the light. So the light would be just hitting it once, but now the light's bouncing off the water and hitting it again. So, so we're magnifying the light. Um, and, 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 and this, 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 the plants here, do you notice how there's a windbreak of bamboo on the right side? So you've got thermal mass rock in the sun. You have water feature that's that also is mitigating frost. I mean, the edges around any water feature are going to resist frost and then be ready earlier in the season. So if you're designing fruit trees and thinking, hey, how do I make this last longer, thrive better? Look at Pelter like we do in my courses and in my book. Um, he's using water features everywhere. Uh, and he's doing it specifically in specific ways with wind patterns. So he gets it aerated without doing any pumps. Amazing, right? Right. Yeah. And so this is permaculture. Partnering plants with nitrogen fixers um, or nitrogen rich plants. And also using nitrogen fixing microbes inside your plants and on their roots. Because... There is the classic nodule forming nitrogen fixation, but then how does everything else get their protein, you know, and their nitrogen to form that protein? Well, it's those microbes. So, um, so make sure that you're getting things that are high in nitrogen or are nitrogen fixers with the nodules that you can kill and die off. Um, whatever it is, I prefer for me annuals as much as possible, though I do some nitrogen fixing perennials. But as much as possible, nitrogen fixing annuals so that I can chop and drop them before they form seed and move on. But I do 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 I do clover. Um, and that's because we're in sand. <laughs> we're in a floodplain. And I really need to hold that together and create uh, a sponge and create deep roots and then really take this. I, I've got, I've got to take like the, like this site and like inject a ton of organic matter. And the fastest way to do that is not compost. It's actually cover crops that are strong and go as far as possible in both ways, starting as early as possible and going as late as possible, which means perennials. So, so that's what I do. And I also use dichondra, but there's so many more, endlessly more, endlessly more. So frameworks, this is really incredibly important. I mean, this could, this is simple as like strategies and tasks and, and the order of tasks and the order of things, how to design spatially a garden, how to design the workflow for an indoor space. This gets you to understand how to not waste your time because the thing is we're doing so much in permaculture that if you don't organize yourself and organize it all, you're just going to be like going and it's just going to be a distraction machine. Don't do that. Let's be really efficient. Let's design things so that they automate. Right. So, so yes, yes.
So these are some of them, but there's, I have, I have many, I have many because, because different strokes for different folks, different scale, different project, different framework. Remember I just said like a workstation versus like a garden, and this is a farm and a business and potentially grazing, potentially orchards, farms, all of it. Um, the key line scale of permanence is incredible. The agrarians, um, let me show you this. The agrarians platform is, is stupendous. So it extends PA Yeomans, it adds in holistic uh, management. Holistic management um, is, is really great for decision-making. And, and he folded that into his work and it's, it's stupendous. And it's amazing that he allowed me to include it in my work because I felt like without this rudder, this framework right here, you can't scale permaculture. And from what I've seen ever since I published this in 2017, yeah, 2017, um, it's only been proven more and more true that this framework, these questions, these thoughts, and this way of designing with the key line patterning, if you don't do this, um, you can't scale up uh, effectively commercially. So, I mean, you it can happen, but but it's it's not going to be efficient. It's not going to be um, calculable. It's not going to be predictable. It's not going to be. Um, this is this is the way to do it. And so. What, what is that some of that stuff? I mean, th this is part of it. Understanding the landscape in a key line geometric way, understanding where key lines are, key points. Incredibly important. And then from there, this is the thing. The key line, that's a guiding contour. That could would be a swale on contour, right? But then everything else is exactly off of it. And there's some beautiful properties around that that makes it so you don't overwater because you're like, oh, the angle will be off. Yes, yes, yes. And it'll increasingly be off the lower it goes. So the, the bottom row is not like compounding moisture. You're wicking it off to the edges of the area. Yeah, it's good. It's good. You're spreading the moisture out. You're making the landscape rehydrated. And, and at the same time, helping yourself, right? This is permaculture. This is what I love. This virtuous cycle. I mean, it's, we're hitting like, it's a terrible metaphor for this, but like we're hitting like five birds with one stone. Um, you know, we're not, don't hit the birds unless you're harvesting and hunting with like slings and, and that's the, the regenerative way for you. <laughs> I know people, I know people that, that are just amazing. You know what I mean? That, that have raised animals in basically a wild scenario. And so when they go and harvest their animals, they're essentially hunting them, which is such an incredible way to raise animals. And I've seen, you know, pigs raised in forest agriculture, agroforestry systems and these pigs, their 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 flesh is completely different, tastes completely different, looks completely different color wise than anything I've ever seen in a store that's labeled pork. So, so these things are incredibly potent and powerful. Uh, no matter what you do, how you do it, um, you, you, I mean, pff, yeah, yeah, I've had every single kind of diet out there <laughs> in my Crohn's journey. So, so wherever you are, it will work for you. Okay, so there's many types of frameworks, many types of perspectives. I showcase as many as I can. Um, and, and then there's the practices. And notice how I say practice. Because you're like, Jeff Lawton does it different really from Darren Doherty. And then Bill Mollison said something different from Fukuoka. And Sepulter says something different. Go down to the principles, bud. Just go down. All you go to, you do, oh, they're doing this. And you find the principle and you're like, oh, okay, that's permaculture. Yes, yes. So seeing the permaculture in other people, seeing the permaculture in other things, the regenerative aspect in that thing is critical. 
because I just brought up reusing glass bottles for water and soda and wine in Europe in the 90s. That's permacultural. That's regenerative because they're just reusing it. It's common sense too. So, so I want you to like recognize that because you already do things that are permacultural. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. For real though. Honor yourself for being permacultural, for being regenerative today, for seeing the possibilities and potentials of the future, a better future already. All right. So these practices are practices, right? So this, I threw these seeds on the ground and I didn't water ever. And they, this is three months, three months into no rain in California. I know. It, and this is, this is the end of the summer and it's all gone to seed. And I did put some orange giant amaranth in there and it grew, but it was tiny, right? It went to a different form. And so it was hot. It was 140 degrees. How many people garden in California and Central Valley? Not people. <laughs> That's where I started. That's where I cut my teeth. Um, and and yeah, yeah, mulch watering barely did anything, but the mulch doing permaculture, right? So, uh, it permaculture all also is about map making. So you end up making incredible maps. I'm going to show a few of mine in my book. You can download my book and there's a ton in there. The example is different people, people better at map making than me, uh, are in my book featured. And that's the thing is I want, I, I always go for as many different modalities and differentiation and examples as possible. Cause remember, I'm the guy creating the menu for you to choose so that you follow your path because once you follow the path, that's yours authentically, whoo, who's going to stop you. You are doing the right thing and you know it. That's the most unstoppable thing. A human who knows that they're doing the right thing. Yeah. And it's their authentic self. Unstoppable, unstoppable. So folks learn to make some incredible maps. And then they have the skill sets to interpret it because it's one thing, you know, it's one thing to be able to like talk about, you know, um, maps and, and, and to be able to, um, like make a map. It's another thing to be able to use it. And so I'm just letting them in. And so it's also a strategic plan because notice how I said timing earlier. Notice how I said the season. Notice how I said, you know, also the dream. We started with the dream. How is that dream going to feel? Mm, the abundance, the freedom. That's your trajectory. That's your trajectory. You lead from that feeling. You lead from that. Because that's going to be your, 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 your compass. That's going to guide you. Okay. So you're going to create your plan. You're going to create your timing. You're going to have your map. You're going to have your dreams, your goals. And then that trajectory is going to guide you day to day. And then I, 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 part of what I was doing, creating regenerative soil and regenerative soil microscopy was creating the tools for the permaculture community to be able to verify their work so that they, they will know that they did the, the right thing and they'll be able to step forward with even more power, more confidence because they know they did it. They are competent. They, they know it, they've proven it. And, and that, that's really, that's where all this began for me, the, the soil side and all that. It starts here. So what happens if you go out into the wilderness without a map? Anyone? What happens, right? What happens in life if you don't make any plans, right? 
from the first book. This is my first map. The first one I did ever. This is the one I did for Jeff Lawton's um, PDC. And this is uh, the land with... Um, okay. So if you look at... Um, let me orient myself. Yeah, if you look at the right side of this of this um this map, where the yellow dot is, that's the garage. And that green area around it is the front area that everyone saw or where where we were growing on the gravel. And then just below it is the hill that everyone saw where all my trees were and the giant amaranth was. It was all just right there below us. Um, and the pond to the big giant pond to the left never happened. Uh, all the little ponds never happened. Um, we moved away and they went a different direction uh, because of fire fears that grandma had. We love grandma. It's okay. Um, but they got rid of almost all the trees in the landscape to create a giant fire break. So... Uh, it's brutal. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Uh, but we have to recognize that um, if we aren't there to take care of something, um, it, it might not be there. You have to find stewards to take care of your things. Uh, and, and in this case, um, someone said they were taking care of it and, they, and it fell through. So... And, and and then and then it got turned into a fire break. So yeah, I then designed this. This is ninety acres in Sonoma County. Uh, this is a, a, a several years later, but this is a hyper detailed map. Um, this is uh, lidar the map. Um, so it's a it's a it's a, you know we're not printing things out on a on a. Uh, printer and then coloring it in at this point doing this all on the computer now we're using really really high quality mapping tools lidar uh, and and this 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 site um actually we were in the middle of doing this work together starting at the top my son cleared two acres of this uh by hand uh at the top area around the water tanks and then um the fires came through and we got evacuated and the greenhouses that you see up top on the right side, the right side, you know what I mean? Around those water tanks. Um, those all died because we couldn't be there and all the water got shut off. And then when we got back, we wanted to get water, even though the water was shut off and the water tankers wouldn't deliver it. And so it was, it was wild west. And uh, that's why we moved to Texas. <laughs> There we go. Um, so, so you can see more detail here. Look to the right side, site nursery and gardens. Those were were where I had purple the the giant uh, purple corn. Um, thank you, Sean, for taking care of those during the fire. He watered those by hand, brought in water to do that. It's it's just crazy. It's just crazy. So so this. This was a crazy time period, um, and and we started on the work on this. Uh, some of this infrastructure was in place. Some of this was built, but the the evacuations drove us out, uh, and it was it was really hard to leave. Uh, we actually left ev almost everything that we owned, and so we had to accept the idea that it all could burn. Uh, and so. This though is 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 a product of allowing legislators to create things that are antithetical to to the local environment and the local um like everything. Uh, it's they needed to do so much more work and be really aggressive and have biochar and thinning, just like we're logging and thinning here. Thing with redwoods is you have to like tailor them. They're a perennial 
logging um, thing, uh, logging industry, because because you cut a redwood down and it regrows from this from the base, and you have to come back eight, seven to eight years later and select one from the sprouts, just like any other perennial that's on the ground. So so it's it's really a unique environment, um, and like America has endless wood because of that. We should just acknowledge that we have endless wood. Um, and this could be really monitored really well. And we could shift everything away from plastic again, have children's toys be made of wood at Christmas. Come on, people. Uh, I, that's what I had as a kid. I had the little wooden toys, you know, but, but, but for real though, like this is regenerative logging. It regrows from the stump. Yes. Like eight of them do. And if you let it out, out overgrow, you ruin them all and they all become crap wood. And so that's what literally happened on the site. So they had all this like lower quality wood. Uh, and then they had some old growth and every time like it came up, it like would like gravitate towards like the, the, the wealth of the old growth. And it was like, no, 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 no. The wealth, the, the wealth is leaving it. So, so it, 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 this was a time period, lots of learning, lots of growth, lots of work. And if you were following me during that time period, you know how it was. Uh, and so soils and earthworks are something that I've always done, always relied upon. Uh, this is this is like that, like I said, just below the garage on that topographic map on the right side, just below down the hill. This is that hill. Okay. You guys are seeing everything, right? I love food forests. Food forests are, I think my favorite aspect of practicing permaculture. Um, but earthworks themselves that we put in as the hard structure of our food forest quite often has the ability to heal the landscapes everywhere. So um, I'm not endorsing, you know, any governments here at all, but um, China, the, U the U.S. and the World Bank together paid to reverse the desertification in nine years um, in the Los Plateau. And that's where agriculture began. So think of the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent, and it's like, the Fertile Crescent is not so fertile, Matt. Yeah, it's a desert like that. Yeah, I get it. So we can fix that. Um, uh, and so it's with earthworks primarily. And, and then obviously planting perennials like we just talked about, you know, but it's not that hard. It just takes hard work and then takes caring for it. Um, it, it takes people being there who can interpret it and understand it, uh, who are going to be the caretakers of that. Um, I, I thought, you know, they were going to be the caretakers of that thing. My, my original food forest. Um, but, but that's the thing that it's like, find people that if you're going to give something, find people that you will take it over for you. Um, but just focus on this for a second though. It's $14 a hectare per year to fix it. So they all know that U S China world bank. Um, and that would sequester like all the carbon. Yeah. So, 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 so there's a lot of like shenanigans going on and like, like that's why I am all about actually doing the work and fixing the actual things because the there's a lot of top down narrative shenanigans going on that has nothing to do with restoring the actual cycles of the planet and reversing desertification i mean the mediterranean is especially the north mediterranean is desertifying it's becoming like northern africa and so it's shifting climates. And so like we literally, and like this is reversing, you know, desertification. So climate types um, are things such as like Mediterranean, um, such as uh, desert climate. Um, and we can affect those. Um, we can tweak those. We can stretch our, 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 our microbiome, uh, our um, microclimates um, to be like touching other zones to a degree, um, as well. But, but this information, 
this powerful change that we could have in the rest restoration of the desertified landscapes of the earth is known, known, and they're not doing it. You know, um, there's it's individuals, it's, it's groups, it's people who have, have taken the initiative. Darren Doherty is planting eight million, uh, eight million trees right now. He's designing the equipment and building the actual equipment to do it. So, so people are doing this. People who just felt the initiative are doing this now. Um, uh, because these governments that knew it didn't do anything. And this project is old now. Um, Neil Spectrum's an incredible example. See those rock dams on contour? One rock dam, you know, multiple rock dams. It slows water down every little bit, every little bit, every little bit. And then they had a giant swale. Notice how it's white sand and then green. Notice how it's nothing and then everything. Yeah. And they just used rainwater. Uh, they collected rainwater in a well and then just watered the crops really, really um, uh, little bits. Uh, and it was it was all perennials. And and they, they didn't get rain for three years, but they were still using the rainwater that they had collected sparingly to keep things alive and then they eventually cut all the water and stopped watering entirely and it's all self-sufficient now uh that's one of the most inspiring videos to watch ever it's the albeda project neil speckman the albeda project on youtube i cry usually every time i watch it you know permaculture empowers us to take action and it can take so many different forms but it's grassroots, it's from us, it's from us taking the action and us connecting to people in our community and helping people. And, you know, my story is I was in the Central Valley, California. I mentioned it before, it's a brittle Mediterranean temperate climate that is desertifying, just like the Mediterranean Europe is desertifying. And so there's fires just like there are in Europe. Um, and there's bar it's processionary caterpillar that's eating their stuff over there. And we have the bark beetle, but it all comes down to the soil actually. Uh, and the microbes. And so look here with me. Um, do you notice something? Okay. Yeah. Burn tree. Right. Um, where's the baby trees? It's bald. And if you look closely, you'll see that green of the living trees there that aren't burned out. Um, they're brown, meaning the bark beetle is killing them. So there's only a little bit of life still in that. That whole hill is going to be gone. So um, this is where this is right below, right above where we lived. And so it's decomposed granite. <laughs> a lot of people were like, "You can't grow anything here." They thought it was crazy. We're trying to grow here. It's super oxidized, super alkaline, and 140 degrees. And so it's the Sierra Nevadas. And traditionally their water, you know, was was great in the Central Valley. They're the largest body of water west of the Mississippi. But then um, legislation was passed such that they started siphoning all the water off from way above the foothills. So now the foothills just burn in California relentlessly because for decades they've been removing the water knowingly, knowing that those areas wouldn't get enough water um, and so now those areas are all burning, um, and driving the people out of there. They could easily, uh, open these dams and restore those areas. Once those people are gone and reclaim that land for themselves, uh, and get it on the cheap. Uh, so, uh, because as you know, we just learned we can restore land in any condition. The Los Plateau has been messed up for 10,000 years. Let's go. We can fix anything, but they also know that. And so you have like a lot of these instances where you have really, really bad actors doing things to the environment um, and driving people out. And I, I think it's a land grab, some of the most beautiful land in America. So what I did, um, I, I did swales, you know, I, I captured water. And I planted, I throw soda, I threw it on the ground, covered it with straw mulch. It's a little bit excess straw mulch there, but it did really well. I know it's a lot. I wouldn't do that much now, but I was young. 
Now, this is my first, you know, my first one. And you can see those swales. You can see the contour lines. Like it's a map that I'm drawing on the ground. And I had my boys help me. It was so much fun. And it just grew and exploded and just got better and better and better. Who wants, who wants a system that gets better and better and better? Yeah. Yeah. And so this system, yes, this system doesn't exist anymore. But this whole area, this is the foothills. This is the area where they don't allow the water to come down. So everyone's wells were drying out. And they did, did a well four times as deep. It was tens of thousands of dollars. And, 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 and even then they started running out of water again. So, so this, is, this is all very difficult. It's difficult to practice permaculture when you're in a larger environment where there are these terrible things happening. Um, but it is possible if you capture rainwater. That was the next level I needed to go to. We start capturing rainwater and storing it. And I would have been able to do it. I was also segueing by doing the, 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 those seeds with no water. That was me, me prepping, prepping my seeds to go without water so that I could start growing food. That was true dry farming in the most harsh climate possible. So, so I was building towards it, but with permaculture and then everything regenerative, it's always, you're, there's always the next level. And so I had progressed as far as I could, and I wanted to go to that next level. Uh, and then we had moved, uh, and no one took it to that next level. Uh, instead, uh, they they it was they weren't able to manage it. But you can see the color of the soil and ground below the swale here. How it literally is darker, richer, blacker, browner with carbon. Yes that is drawn down from the CO2 and photosynthesis and is pumped into the ground. Corn and sorghum has the ability to inject 400 times the, 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 the they, they were talking about Iowa, the, the, this study, um, it's in my book, um, but they, corn, the corn in America can, it takes down 400 times the annual release of CO2 every single year and injects it into the soil but then they till it up and again and gas it all off. So all that stuff's fixable. Um, soil is really easily repairable. If you follow nature, just follow nature. That's what I do. You know, you know, just like listen to the feedback from nature and then follow suit. And then things take off like rockets. That's why people like have taken, you know, regenerative soil and double their yields. You know, it's, it's, and they were already using the permaculture student too, the book and the lanes methods and all this stuff, but they used that book and doubled it. So as a university, uh, it's, uh, Utah state university. Um, so super grateful, super grateful for that. So this is, this is that early garden and you can really see, um, how it matured and I was able to, to really grow in abundance. Um, I was able to grow a great diversity, a giant, you know, amaranth that was, you know, well over my height. Um, I, I mean, I never like measured it, so it's hard to say um, how high it got, but um, it was, they were all really, really tall, um, over a dozen feet for sure. And then um, there, I was, I was, I had such a prolific system that it would crawl out. Remember, it's 140 degrees. How hot do you think gravel gets when the soil gets 140 degrees? Did this stuff care? No, the squash would be like, let's go, man. I'll make my own shade. And it did. And so I I, I just was, was, was really just wowed by permaculture over and over again as I applied it. I was able to raise my kids in that in that environment. That is the shady side of the hill where the corn, that's the corn. So the corn grew there and it got, you know, 16 feet, 17 feet tall and it formed crowns of corn on top. I have pictures. Crowns of, and it's actually on YouTube with a Peruvian, uh, impossible Peruvian corn video. And so this is where I did it. And it's because it's the shady side of the hill. Look in the background. 
do you guys see how it's just dead? The ground is just dead. And so it was an extreme environment. You can see around it that it's just dead, right? And so I, I did chop and drop. I mixed with the weeds. I drove the weeds out by the pressure of the seeds. Um, and, and I had such an abundance, such an abundance and multi-level ca canopies. And all I did was I added compost and compost tea. I should add that I put water kefir grains in my compost and compost tea. And those are lab factories and yeast factories. So I was basically adding EM, a portion of EM into my compost and compost tea. So I've been practicing like near EM effective microbes. Um, and bio, I've been practicing biofertilizers, in other words, for the whole time. Because for my, my, my gut, water keeper was essential. So I did compost and I did undiluted compost tea because you already diluted it. Come on. Right. You put it in the water. Right. So, so I would, I would not use diluted tea because the compost you can put down and it's not diluted or anything. It's not added water. And that was great too. So why would you do that? You know, and I guess it's to stretch it, but no effectiveness is effectiveness. And so I, I changed entire sites with this compost. And so I'm really, ex I'm, I'm just really excited to share that with you. Kefir grains, secret weapon. And then I planted tons of nitrogen fixers and a huge diversity. So I was doing like a dozen different types of cowpeas in summer to build the soil and fix nitrogen. And you're like, wait a second. Summer nitrogen fixing? Yeah. Yeah, I know most people are doing the fall and the winter cover crops, and that's good. But the, we got to do the summer. We got to build it up. And in fact... That's a lot of what I do. I, I build the soil before I go so that the soil's ready and it gives me that signal. And then I just push and then it goes straight up. And so that's what I do in all the sites. I really focus first on soil. And then I used earthworks. Um, and I, I simply applied permaculture. Like that's all I did. Um, and so I, I want you to think about that dream. I want you to think about what if you started practicing permaculture? What would you accomplish? What would you do if you were able to put all your dreams into reality? How would it feel to have that abundance, to be able to eat those, eat those homegrown mushrooms, to be able to eat those, those, that homegrown corn or squash or beans or figs or fruit? But Joa, uh, anything I, I'm, I'm, I'm most excited about eating for Joa. Um, I, I think pineapple guava is like literally a delicacy. And the fact that I have so many bushes of it. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is the year. This is the year. So wherever you are, start practicing, start moving forward on your dream. Make it a reality. What could you do? If you want to learn more, check out the permaculturestudent.com. That's just the permaculturestudent.com. And there are books, there's free courses, there's a bunch of ebooks that are free for you. So feel free to go on there and start downloading ebooks and check it out because, um, yeah, yeah, that's there for you. Thank you for being here. Let's do a giveaway and some QA. All right. Let's do it. All right. How was that? Let me know in the chat. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Phil. Andrea says, very informative. Thank you for being here, Andrea. Carrie says, thank you. You're so welcome. Jackie says, great. Carrie says, thank you. You're so welcome. Tyson says, thank you, everyone. Brian says, will there be a replay? Yes, I'll put a replay up. I'll put it on YouTube. 
A great intro. Thanks, Matt. You're welcome, Bree. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Awesome and inspired. Thank you, Donna. Super says Robert. So many of you here. Thank you for being here and making the time. So I think, you know, I've been doing so much soil for so many years that like in this recent time, and it's been so busy that folks might not know where I came from. And it really was that that humble beginning it really was trying to find those things that serve those things that scaled those things that allowed people to have careers and businesses. So let's, um, let's ask, uh, what's one new thing you learned today? Um, this is for this, this is the permaculture two one is my first book. This is the, the set. I'm going to give this away right now. So what was one new thing that you learned today? Vanessa, it's in the first section of the course. If you just refresh it, it'll be there now. Map says Elizabeth. Andrea says it's possible. I love that. Bree says I learned about swales and that they save water. That's awesome. Carrie says that is doable. Yes, yes. Robert says power of windbreaks. Mm -hmm. Judy says I learned that dry farming is possible. Yes. Bonnie says the edge effect. Thank you for being here. Randy says a thousand years disappears are uh, disasters are repairable. Yeah. 10,000 years of disasters are repairable. It's true. Adding water, kefir grains. Yes, Donna. Yes. Save my seeds says April. I love it. Jackie says that one can undo desertification. Jackie Harris. Thank you for being here. All right. I think Jackie, I'm going to send you this. So here's the deal. You got to let me know your, your, your address by emailing it to me. You don't need to put it publicly. So email me at matt at the permaculture student.com. Thank you for, for, for joining us, Jackie. Can't wait to send these to you. These are, these are my first books. This is what, what began it all this lot of, lot of like art. Yeah. I'm excited to send it to you. So Jackie, email me at matt, M A T T at the permaculturestudent.com. And if you go to the permaculturestudent.com, you can click on contact there and find it there as well. All right. Thank you for being here. What questions do you all have? Oh, Vanessa, you're considering signing up. Okay. It's Saturdays, one o'clock or four o'clock. That's when we're doing the lives. And I, I do that as like the starter, but I want, depending on people are like, no, it's only Friday that I'm available. And like half the class says that I'll shift it over. I, I've had so many courses with so many students for so many years that I am very aware that the population could be mostly Australian one, one season. And that's okay. We just got to be very sensitive of the timing for that so that we reach everyone you know what I mean? And so that's why I do one o'clock central and 4 p.m. central. 4 p.m. central reaches the morning in New Zealand and in, uh, in Australia. So I do hope that you join us. That begins Monday. Um, but what questions do you guys have about permaculture? How exactly do you do the dry farming? Well, first you need to identify seeds that can do it. I did hosantle and amaranth because I reasoned that they were um, they were crops that our ancestors used with very little water or no watering. I mean, red Aztec spinach is the other name for, for Hasantle, right? So I was like, did the Aztecs water? <laughs> Let's see. And so I threw it on the ground and then didn't water. And it grew really well. And so I timed it. Obviously, in that early spring, you want to do it like with the rain or at, right after a rain. So that it gets moisturized and then the heat starts and then it, the seeds start running. These seeds I had already trained. So they were very good at sprouting and finding their root into the ground. They were throw sows. So I had already trained the seeds. 
I had selected seeds that I were re was reasonably sure this would be a good idea what to do with. And I also, I, I like read seed histories and stuff. I know. I love it. But, but, and, 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 and then I, I monitored it, you know, I was actually like seeing the feedback from that and being like, it can do this. It's doing it just fine. The morning dews are enough. And so it just was really incredible um, to see that, 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 that change um, and to see what was possible. You'd love to hear more about Bokashi. We got an entire section on Bokashi. So Bokashi is, uh, it, it, it's composted organic matter, but it's guided by certain microbes that traditionally are called effective microbes. And it's a trademark name now. And they simply are yeast, lactic acid bacteria, and Rhodosotomonas palustris primarily. And there's other microbes too, like streptomyces um, and, and others. But, but the reality is um, everyone can do this. Everyone can be growing those microbes. Um, even if you feel like I don't have access to Rhodosotomonas palustris, uh, you do. You can buy this um, at Algae Barn. There's a pure culture of purple non sulfur bacteria. So yeast and it's cerveza yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, not the lager yeast. That will be bad. Don't do that. Uh, it's because it promotes ecto, not endo. And you want endo because you're doing gardens and fruit and all the things we want to eat. And so that's all except for blueberries. And that's ericoid. That's a completely different thing too. Ah! But my point is, is that you can do all that yourself. Um, and all those differentiations we can go over as well. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, but, but Bokashi is, is really easy, really potent and powerful. And it's just one tool in the, the broad range of tools that we have in permaculture, but, but it's, it's great. I love it. I love it. I do, I do tons of work with EM and I use EM to unlock a lot of things. And there's a huge amount of information um on that um uh, in in my course here's my email address um jackie just email me and i'll and i'll get and i'll get that to you all right so what are the questions what is a good step to, uh, first step to turn clay soil into Colorado and in Colorado suitable for growing. Well, the first step is to identify what's going on. So it's like clay soil. There's a lot more information there. Okay. Um, what, what, what minerals are, are, are present? What microbes are present? How much organic matter? How much or lack thereof structuring? Is it something that you can rip? Is it acreage we're talking about or is it a garden is it something you can just broad fork and break up or is it something that's so big that we have to like you know use a machine um all of those things go into that but but the the, the number one key is if it's hard pan is that you have to disturb it so it's like it's dead it's anaerobic it's hard pan it's not like there's life that you're killing when you when you cut that soil. And so you're going to disturb it. You're going to break it up. You're going to rip it. And you might even have to do, because if it's, if it's toxic, you're going to have to mix the remedy in. Um, and Phil says that sounds disturbing. Um, no, you, you have to disturb the soil in order to, because if it's, if it's at rest and it's toxic, and you have a layer of anaerobic and a layer of salt and the the pressure from the plow that's been going over it has created a compaction layer you got to break that up you got to disturb it you got to poke it you know you can't let it be cuz it will hold your whole system back yeah it's disturbance positive disturbance and the thing is it's like we have to do in our even in our own bodies we got to work out get that hormetic levels of stress 
Um, in order for an annual to grow, you have to disturb the surface. There has to be an area that's clear soil for that seed to take. So we, 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 you, you have to consider it all. And that's why I say it is, it is all about your context. It's all about what your goals are. And it's all about, you know, like the tools that you have as well. Awesome. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I'll just do a hypothetical for you. So let's say we're on a few acres and you, you have this hard clay and everything. We could have a key line plow go over that on contour. And then you could be injecting uh, uh, a, a, compost tea or compost extract probably better compost extract uh or or em or biofertilizer mix in as you're going through that and ripping it so it's immediately getting relief as you're breaking it up and then you can be planting trees or perennials or even annuals in that rip as you're going and injecting it so you're doing three things all at once and then you're putting in what those roots are now on contour under the ground are an invisible swale. So you have interference all along that contour underground. So as the water flows down the hill, it stops, stops, stops. Just like those rock dams do on the surface in Neil Speckman's system. But that might, might not be what you're doing. You might be you know what I mean? You might be doing like a, a grazing operation and then you would be doing a key line plow, injecting and reseeding, you know? What is a good source for EM starter, Terraganics? Um, how do you know uh, you have hard pan? Uh, get in there, uh, Raul. Get in there and dig up some of it and see. Um, it's really important to disturb that soil a little bit to get to know it a bit. Uh, so, so dig up, dig down, see what, what the layers are like. Uh, I was showing someone something and uh, a site and, and they were like, wow, I mean, it feels like nothing's happened. And I'm like, well, let's, let's dig down. And then we dug down and it's like chocolate loam, beautiful soil. And then it's like pure, pure sand. And I was like, so we built this. And they were like, whoa. And it's like, yeah, that's what we did. And so it's like progress. You know what I mean? Uh, you have to disturb the soil, open it up to see. Uh, and that's why soil testing is so important. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Hi, Jackie. Um, I, I, I'm not, I can't email you. you, get, you you're going to have to email me. That's how... <laughs> That's how it'll work. Um, so if you did an inoculation on your garden in winter, would it survive in New York? Well, did the inoculation take? If you're in my course for the microscopy, you could look at your roots and see if the roots are actually glowing. And then you'll know that it survived and it's inoculating the new generation in the early spring. You'll be able to look at your, your plants roots and know, but, but there's no way to know unless you can you verify that right so you don't it, most people don't even know if their initial inoculation even took you might have bought you know old or not good or you know any of the above inoculant and then it didn't take and so next summer there's nothing there because it didn't even take then inoculants are good and bad they're not all the same so, so we have to always look to know. The value of Bokashi was shut down during a permaculture course a few years ago. Um, shot down. Um, well, that's funny. Um, they probably just didn't weren't acquainted with the actual microbes involved and the actual processes. And I mean. That's why I do DNA testing. That's why I work with a microscope and do epifluorescence, dark field, manual lighting. I look at things in uh, a variety of ways so that I actually um, don't get fooled or tricked because there's a lot of stuff on the internet. There's a lot of people saying things. Um, and that's why people really value my courses because they're all cited. 
I, I, I go out and do the reading and gather the data and then practice it and test it out. So, so I hope that you guys uh, join me in some of those classes. All right. I have 45 degree slope uh, of soil over loose rocks. Any advice? Yeah, it's really about just um, tying that up. And you could do a terrace potentially, but it's really about um, tying that up. Um, 45 degrees is very, very steep. Um, so you could do swales, um, but more likely a terrace um, would be good and being really aggressive going into the hill and redefining it. Um, we we go over that in my course and my books. Uh, the best the best math and the best designs for earthworks are Brad Lancaster's water harvesting books and his volume two, the one where I, I do the re review quote on the uh, <laughs> that's the one. Um, that's the one with all the math and slopes and everything, because swales are great, um, but but. 45 degrees is really steep. So, 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 so keep that in mind that you might do a different earthwork given that. We need more information about seeds and the method of throwing on the ground method. Yeah. And so, um, throwing in straw compost mix. Um, yeah, no. So, I do chop and drop, but I always want to make sure that there's exposed soil so that when I throw seeds, they touch soil. So it's really about that delicate balance and knowing your seeds, knowing your soil, knowing your plants and having trophic, uh, having multi um, canopies. So different levels. So the moisture is trapped and things are shaded so that there's like a nursery effect happening. That's like what I do. Um, and that's why those seeds are so effective. Um, so I do literally throw them on the ground and I would do it all over. I would travel around and do it. And people would be like thinking I was crazy. And then the seeds are still self seeding at in Balboa park in San Diego at the world beat center. So you can go and see, Hey, this is the orange giant. Hey, this is the sorghum. This is, this is the same exact ones from all the videos Matt did. Yeah. And I threw them once on the ground. This is what seed training does. I was a seed saver for many years before I was really into permaculture. I was doing heirloom organic gardening first. And so I was all about heirloom seeds and reading about them and reading books about them. So, so yeah. It's, um, and then the Ruth Stout method, um, that tends to create anaerobic soils that tends to create slug, um, habitat. It's, it, it, it's a great, um, step in the history towards where we are today, but, um, the, the, the Ruth Stout method, it's, it's, it's not a perfect, perfect way of doing things. There's a much more productive, uh, pathways that can be guided with the right biology. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, everyone. All right, looking for one last question. To train them for growing after being thrown on the ground, do you have to do it? Harvest from what grows and then keep repeating? Yes, that's exactly right, Donna. Because what happens is you throw them on the ground, the first generation, and like one comes up and you're like, did I just like waste like half a pack of seeds? No, you found the winner in the pack of seeds because people are grabbing all the seeds that they're saving to sell you. They're not growing, they're not grabbing the best seed and then giving you only the best. They're grabbing all the seeds from all the plants and selling you them. So your seeds have winners and losers in them. And in nature, when a tree sets down seedlings about it, how many of those trees survive? The seedlings. They put out the seeds and then the seedlings. And then it's like one out of a thousand, right? 
maybe one out of 10,000, depending on the tree. But that's how it works. You need to have like that fleet of, 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 of life going out, A, because it's part of the cycling. You need that be part of the cycling. The fertility of the soil is part of that. But B, that's a selection process. The one that's the perfect one out of 2,000 or out of 10,000 is the one that grows. Right? And then it's a mother tree. So the mother tree is giving it special nutrients and feeding it. And, and there's a nursery effect. Yeah. It's amazing. So I, you've got it. You've got, you've got the pattern. And so it's, 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 and what we're, what we're, what are we doing? We're sending a message to nature, throwing those seeds on the ground. Nature's responding. Many are called, few are chosen. That one, that one plant responds. You save seed from that one plant. And, and it, depending on diversity of, of, of your seeds, you really have to go. And that's why I recommend seed gardener. You might be able to do it from one plant because of that, that it can handle that. Some plants can do that, but some plants you have to actually save seed from hundreds of plants for genetic diversity. So really depends, huh. but but you could save those seeds. And then when you apply those seeds the next year, they're so robust. They know, they know the climate, they know the timing, they know they're going to be thrown on the ground. They're like, it's going to be just like last year, dude, get ready. And then they go. And so, so I, I, I really, really value seed saving because they're so much better than any seeds you can buy. The seeds that you buy are like everything. It's not like the best of the best. You select the best of the best. That's why seed saving was always the thing that I taught. And it's always the thing I still do and model because it's, it's like the secret weapon. You know, it's regenerative soil, heirloom seeds that you seed save yourself. Like all these things are like game changers and allow for people to practice permaculture at that higher level. All right. Thank you all for being here and being part of this. I'm Matt Powers. Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And I will see you all, I hope, on Sunday. Because I'm going to do Permaculture, the Solution for All Seasons, where we start delving into more of these, these different examples of people doing different things with permaculture uh, on Sunday. So I hope that you join us for that. That's going to be so much fun. And, and yeah, it's going to be awesome. So this is a, a webinar series I'm doing. Thank you for being here, and I'll see you soon. All right, have a great one.